Okay, what we want to be able to do is uh, calculate delta S of the system, um, delta H of the system, delta G of the system, and K of the system. And then <clears throat> from those calculations, we can see if it's favorable or unfavorable. That is, if there's a driving force or no driving force. And so um, with the, the delta G's here, at like minus 50 to minus 200 kilojoules per mole, there's a pretty strong driving force. If you look at the K, it's 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 35, which is heavily biased towards the product. You know, but from minus 50 to plus 50, um, it's not heavily biased one way or the other. There's going to be a significant quantity of both reactants and products at the final equilibrium. And then with delta G's greater than 50, uh, it's going to be heavily biased towards the reactants. Very little product, you'd see. But we do uh, equilibrium calculations, that is chapter 15 style chem 1B stoichiometry problems <coughs> in this entire range here, which is fine. All right, that's just calculating the delta G and the K <clears throat> given the values that we have. But another thing we can do is we can try to manipulate the driving force. You know, what are the ways that we looked at for manipulating the driving force? The, well, probably the easiest way is to just change the what. That is, we want to either increase or decrease the driving force. We might try to change the example, uh, water doesn't really like to boil at room temperature, so we might try to change what to get water to boil spontaneously. Temperature? The temperature. So the temperature is the biggest way um, we can change delta G. And so with temperature, you know, temperature is either going to increase or decrease um, the driving force. And so. And it, it's, this happens regardless, you know, if it's non-spontaneous at all temperatures, we can make it slightly less non-spontaneous or slightly more non-spontaneous by adjusting the temperature. And in fact, if it's non-spontaneous at all temperatures, then increasing temperature makes it even <coughs> less spontaneous, and decreasing temperature makes it um, still non-spontaneous, but not as um, big of a barrier or wall to that. We can also change delta G by manipulating what? By going non-standard conditions. So what would a standard solution of HCl be in, in this contents for thermodynamic one molar. But what if we went to 12 molar HCl? You know, would that increase the driving force? And typically it does, you know, the, the higher the concentration. And so we could try that. We could try combination of the two. So for example, <clears throat> we could try using both non-standard and a temperature other than 298 Kelvin. There's another way we can manipulate delta G, and that's by coupled reactions. And so these are common ways of trying to make, it, let's say, a non-spontaneous reaction more spontaneous or spontaneous. <clears throat> so um, we did, um, for H2O liquid to H2O gas, we did this, we saw that delta G is positive, so it's non-spontaneous. But we saw that um, from a previous calculation that we could increase the temperature. And <clears throat> what we can do is we can get delta G equal to zero under standard conditions.
Okay, what if um, increasing the temperature wasn't an option? Then what we could do is we could try doing a non-standard condition at 298. And so we'll just do a delta G under non-standard conditions at 298. What does this equal, 298 Kelvin? Delta G under non-standard conditions is equal to delta G under standard conditions at 298 plus RT ln of Q. It, you know, the plus and the minus, this gets mixed up, but one way you can think about it is if Q grows bigger, we have more product. And the bigger Q grows, the larger ln Q is, and that means it's larger and positive because R is positive, T is positive. And therefore, it makes it less spontaneous. So this is the correct sign. If I put negative here, then it's incorrect because that would make it more spontaneous as we increase the product. And so does somebody have the delta G naught value as 9.7 something from <coughs> previous? Calculation. Eight point five seven. All right, thank you. And so this is eight point five seven kilojoules plus RT L and a Q. <clears throat> so this is positive. So what we try to do is we try to make L and a Q um, negative. If we can make this term negative here, then we might be able to cancel out this eight point five seven here. Okay, so first we have to figure out what Q is. And this is where Q is equal to the activity of the products, which would be H2O gas raised to the first power, divided by the activity of the reactants, which would be H2O liquid, also raised to the first power because the coefficients are 1. The activity of the gas, we're going to just say, is going to be about equal to its partial pressure. The activity of a liquid is just one. It's a pure liquid. and pure liquids, the activity or concentration does not change. And so Q is just equal to the partial pressure of H2O gas. So Q is equal to QP in this case, which is also equal to QP. So what we want is we want this term. If we can get this term to be equal to negative 8.57, then we can make it spontaneous. We'll make this spontaneous. So we have to figure out, well, R is fixed, T is fixed. It's just Q. So we have to figure out some Q such that this term will become minus 8.57. And so the way we typically do this is like this. Um, we just, just set delta G at 298 Kelvin equal to zero. That means it's going to transition from positive to zero to negative. And so we want to hit that transition. This is going to be equal to 8.57 kilojoules plus RT ln of Q. And so I'm going to go ahead and um, <coughs> subtract 8.57 from both sides and divide by RT. So we're going to get ln of Q is equal to 8.57 kilojoules divided by RT. Okay, then R is um, 8.3145. Joules per Kelvin. This is for a mole. T is 298 Kelvin. And to get the units to cancel, I'm going to have to convert this to joules here. So let's go ahead and do that.
Uh, so calculating this, I'm going to get um, 8,570 divided by 8.3145 divided by 298. Now, I forgot the negative sign here. I know I had to have a negative sign because I need the fraction to be less than 1. So, um, let's make that negative. And then I'm going to take the inverse natural log of this. In other words, E raised to the power. Oops. Shoot. Did somebody calculate it? What Q is? What did you get, Zane? Thanks. Um, now I have three sig figs here, and when I when I this is the ln of q, so then this would be okay here. We'll just do that. This is going to be bar. Will be the units. Now q I said it and k are dimensionless, but when we look at the q here, well, it's just equal to the pressure of the water. And so boiling occurs when the atmospheric pressure is equal to the vapor pressure. And so what I need to do here is I need to get the um, pressure here at 0 0.0315 bar and the pressure here at 0. And so we need a P atmosphere equal to 0 0.0315. 315 bar, and then it will start to boil. Now, 0.03 bars, is that possible? Yeah, that's 31.5 millibar. And that's not difficult to achieve using a vacuum pump. A vacuum pump can pull down to much um, lower pressures than that. And you could even use a hand vacuum pump to get that kind of pressure. And so it should be possible to boil water at room temperature. I think I've shown maybe this a video, um, although I'm not sure if I can pull it out. The one I want is boiling water with a little hand crank pump. This is a standard vacuum pump here. <clears throat> I think this first one was the one with the hand crank pump. Let's take a look at this video here. We think of the normal boiling point of water as being 100 degrees Celsius, but that is because we are at one so atmosphere. Minutes, pressure. One minute 53, that's this water okay. is currently 21 degrees Celsius. So here's the vacuum tube here. The jar and make the this water is just a vacuum jar. I don't know what kind of pump they have it set up to. Unfortunately, our vacuum, our house vacuum, is not strong enough to do this. Otherwise, I'd like to do this. I wish they'd show us the vacuum. The water molecules to so escape. this is not a hot plate, and. Um, this is just a platform. And so we can see water starting to boil at room temperature here. We can see, but let's check its temperature again. It's not a very vigorous boil. You can get a vigorous boil there. In this demonstration, I am taking water that's in a beaker, and it has a thermometer. Oh, this one in has it. thermometer. This boiling is when the atmospheric pressure upward, which is maximum rate of evaporation for boiling. So you can actually see it starting to now happen now, and there's our boiling. Water. Okay, this is a more vigorous. Now, watch. Do you take see careful, uh, the thermometer 
here is providing nucleation sites for growing bubbles. Out here on the smooth surface of the glass, do you see much bubble formation? No, so usually what we need is some kind of surface where bubbles can, little baby bubbles can form. This happens for crystals as well. So if you're trying to prevent nucleation, you're trying to grow big crystals, we gotta make sure everything's clean. You know, if, if dust gets in there and there are no objects, we don't wanna nucleate a whole bunch of crystals. We wanna nucleate some crystals. Sometimes it's hard just to nucleate one crystal. And so there are a whole bunch of things um, that you do. The temperature of the system crystals. The same thing is actually falling um, a little bit. Normally when we boil, we want to nucleate lots and lots of baby bubbles and not have them grow very big. Because if you only nucleate a few bubbles and those bubbles grow big, then we have something called bumping. When bumping happens, you grow these gigantic bubbles which hit the surface and cause a lot of turbulence here and splattering. And so um, we use boiling so chips for that. Drop. Boiling chips have lots of phases on the crystal. Celsius, um, allow bubbles to form Very interesting. Like this here. How can you boil at 21 degrees Celsius? Because boiling anyway, is when the, the atmospheric is pressure still equals the vapor pressure. pressure. And at, at 21 degrees Celsius, we're producing like a low amount of air pressure. Degrees, degrees, you know? If I have low force for atmospheric pressure pushing down, you've got boiling. Look carefully, though. The temperature is dropping. The temperature is room, I think. We could use a combination. Some people said they're using body heat to boil water. Um, we, would, we don't need to, as strong of a vacuum. So for example, let's say I wanted to boil water using our house vacuum. So I'm going to estimate our house vacuum. Guesstimate. Maybe let's say I'm going to guess that our house vacuum is like a half an atmosphere maybe, which is really a, a weak vacuum. And so here, uh, anyway, uh, just to finally answer, one way we can get this to happen spontaneously is go under non-standard conditions, and that is change the pressure. And or concentration, depending on the problem, you know. So rather than using one molar, use 16 molar, you know. Um, nitric acid, and then the concentration of the reactants increases, that makes Q even smaller. The smaller the Q, the more negative it is here. We should um, flip it from being <coughs> non-spontaneous to spontaneous. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to try a combination of these two. We're going to try a combination of temperature and non-standard conditions to try to manipulate our delta G. So what we're going to say here is uh, we're going to try to boil um, water, you know, at, um, at under non-standard con conditions. We're going to um, have the vapor pressure of the water equal to half an atmosphere. So if the vapor pressure equals a half an atmosphere and the atmospheric equal atmospheric pressure equals half an atmosphere, then water will boil. You know, the vapor pressure just has to match the atmospheric pressure and then we get boiling. And that's going to happen spontaneously. So um, what we have to figure out is at what temperature am I going to get a vapor pressure of a half, half an atmosphere? And so T is equal to what? Well, in Chem 1A, how would you have done this? If you wanted to get a um, vapor pressure of half an atmosphere, how would we have done this? In Chem 1A. Ideal gas law we wouldn't be able to use because vapor pressure contains both a liquid and a gas. If it only contained a gas, then we could use the ideal gas law. But the problem is, is liquid is going to evaporate. And so the higher the temperature, the more molecules. So N is actually changing the number of moles. And so the number of moles changes um, exponentially. So um, typically we get this by the
Do you know what the clausius clapeyron equation describes? <clears throat> Let's see if I can get it. Clausius. Do you remember the vapor pressure curves? <clears throat> see vapor pressure curves. What page was that on? 532, I think. This is measuring vapor pressure in chapter 12. <clears throat> you remember these vapor pressure curves? If I have a vapor pressure curve, it's easy. If I want um, half an atmosphere, half an atmosphere is going to be half of 760, which would be about 380. If I go to 380, and what is the temperature? 380, it's about 80 degrees C, roughly. And so um, at half an atmosphere, um, water should boil at 80 degrees C. Right? We just use the vapor pressure curve. At one atmosphere, water should boil at 100 degrees C. Right? 100, the black line I'm looking at. The black line is water. At more than one atmosphere, water's boiling point is going to be higher than 100 degrees C. So what is the mathematical equation describing the vapor pressure curve? You know, this is what we do. We, you, you get the data, you graph it, and then you try to come up with an empirical equation that describes the graph. What is the empirical equation that describes the graph? It's the Clausius. There are three forms for the clausius clapeyron equation that we use. And so we don't have to have the graph. We could just have an equation. And this would be the vapor pressure law. This is one of the forms. Um, actually, don't, they don't give us all the forms. Um, this curve is what we call an exponential. Here. <clears throat> this curve is an exponential. And um, an exponential is going to have the, this kind of form. You know, this is from chapter 12. The pressure is going to equal some kind of pre-exponential constant, e to the some stuff here, has this kind of form. And you could just fit it mathematically, but we can relate these constants to actual um, physics of variables. Then we come up with this equation here. <laughs> you know, these are the constants here, and then we can come up with this sort of equation here. And so <clears throat> the equation that describes that curve is going to look like this um, <clears throat> based on um, what we do here. This is e to the minus delta h over r t. And this constant, this pre-exponential constant, is going to be um, what we call um, b. b from this equation here. And what we can do here is um, <clears throat> we can get this into different forms. And so one of these forms is this one, um, which is the ln of p. We'll just take the natural log of that. We'll get rid of the e term here. And we get this minus delta h over r. 1 over t um, plus b, using the property of logs. And then the Clausius, this is going to be p1, t1. And so the Clausius Clapeyron, the formal version of the Clausius Clapeyron is an ln of p2 minus ln of p1 trick. When we do that, that's going to equal the ln of p2 divided by p1 
and then we just subtract it, you know, T1 minus T2, delta H are the same, so we'll get minus delta HR over R, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1, and the B's cancel. And so these are different forms of the Clausius Clapeyron. The first form here describes the curve. The second form <coughs> is in this equation because it's, it's the reason it's in this equation here is because it's easier to do a, what's called a linear least squares fit of a straight line than it is to do a least squares fit of a curve. So when we're fitting data, experimental data, it's harder to fit a curve than it is a straight line. And so this is why they convert it into this mathematical form so that they can just do a straight line and then determine the slope from this. And the slope here would be this delta H over R term. And so we can get delta H. This is the slope delta H of vaporization over R. And then we have this. This one we don't have to make any line. This one we can calculate. We can calculate the vapor pressure at any temperature. This is very powerful because let's say I want the vapor pressure at 150 degrees C. What is the vapor pressure of water? Well water is all going to boil um, at 150 degrees C basically, but we can calculate, you know, based on this, what it should be. It's going to have a very high vapor pressure because it should be boiling completely. So I, I already know the answer because I, I, I remember back in chapter 12, this is making the connections. How you make these connections, you know, <clears throat> is by reviewing the stuff. You know, um, you got to once in a while go back and review your old stuff so that you can connect it to different things. And so it's very handy to do. Um, and it's not like everybody's going to always spell out what the connection is. A, a lot of times nobody will tell you what the connection is and they'll just test you on it. That's what I found not to be the case. But we're looking at something at around 80 degrees C. But that's not the only way we could do this. We could use thermodynamics to figure this out as well. So we could use the clausius Clapeyron. Um, in fact, this clausius Clapeyron is going to look very similar to the equations that we get from thermodynamics that we're going to see here. And so that's another connection you, you're going to make is because when you look at this equation, um, which I'm going to draw out probably, then you'll see. Do you see this equation here, ln of q? Well, what is q? L, uh, q is p, although it's hard to see the connection there. All right, now, um, now we have this. So we have delta G at temperature T. This is a very famous equation. Delta G temperature T is equal to delta G naught at temperature T mm -hmm. plus RT ln of Q. So we, we know what Q should be. In fact, what we want is we want this um, So we want this to be an equilibrium at a pressure of 0.5 atmospheres. So what we're going to do is we want this to go to zero, right? That's what we need. So we need delta G. Right now it's positive. So we need delta G temperature T to go to zero so that we can 
switch this to negative. And this is going to equal delta G naught at temperature T plus RT ln of Q. Q is going to equal K in this case because we're at equilibrium. And then K is going to be 0 0.5. Um, I'm going to just, uh, in fact, this is supposed to be bar. So let's go with the half a bar. <clears throat> because um, now we switch to bars. A bar and an atmosphere are close. So I, I see what delta G naught was from the earlier calculation. Our delta G naught from the earlier calculation was uh, 8.57 kilojoules positive. Can I use that here? Positive 8.57 kilojoules. No. no, why not? Yeah, because we're not at 298 Kelvin. And so we need to get this to 298. So there are two things we can do. Um, we can calculate it, but I don't know what the temperature is, right? That's what we're trying to solve for. But we know that delta G naught at temperature T is going to be about equal to delta G and delta H naught at 298 minus T delta S naught at 298. And so this is going to be under standard conditions. Let's just say it's about equal to that, plus RT ln K. And we want this whole thing to equal zero. So we're going to solve this for T, and then we get the equation that we had derived earlier. You know, T is going to equal delta H naught at 298. Well, that's an assumption, divided by um, R ln of K, uh, actually we'll just say delta S, let me make sure I get the sign correct here, um, so I want to add this and subtract this, minus R ln of K. And so we can plug in the temperature here. Um, what was delta H? It was 44.0 kilojoules. Delta S was 118. Was that right? Joules per Kelvin. R 8.3145 joules per Kelvin. This is all for one mole, ln of 0.5. And then we got to make sure the units work out, so I'm going to change this to joules on the top and see what we get here. So it's 0.5, um, we'll take the natural log of that, times negative 8.3145. Plus 118. Invert this times 44,000. I had 355.5 uh, Kelvin. Minus 273. I get 82.5 degrees C. That's kind of what we estimated, right? 80, about 80 degrees C. So here we calculated it. Now, I had mentioned that the clausius clapeyron equation looks very similar to this. And it's going to look very similar in, in this sense. Okay. 
Um, if we look at Clausius, um, Clapeyron, and um, and K. You know, for H2O liquid goes to H2O gas. K is equal just to the pr pressure of the H2O gas. It's the activity of the H2O gas, which is the pressure, divided by the activity of H2O liquid, which is 1. So K is just equal to pressure. And then we know that um, delta G naught is equal to uh, minus RT ln of K. And th therefore K is equal to E to the minus delta G naught over RT. In other words, the pressure is equal to E to the minus delta G naught over RT. So the pressure, we're going to see this vapor pressure curve that's exponential like this. And so this is the pressure versus the temperature. We generate the vapor pressure curve. But this is uh, under standard conditions, right? And the vapor pressure changes with temperature, but this is kind of what we, we kind of see for this. <clears throat> Delta G, unfortunately, is going to be changing, changing with temperature. So we have, to, we have to change that. And so this is going to be E to the minus um, Delta H naught minus T Delta S naught over RT. Okay, now this works a little bit better. Because of this term changes with temperature significantly, whereas these terms don't change with temperature significantly. All right, so that's using a combination of temperature and non-standard <coughs> conditions to um, change the driving force. The last one, and I forgot to talk about this the other day, is coupled reactions. So this is the final section of chapter 13. So one example is uh, gold and nitric acid. So if we do gold and nitric acid, um, we'll inventory this. So we have H gold solid, solid gold, H plus nitrate and water. And then um, we'll label this. Gold is a reducing agent, metals. H plus is an oxidizing agent, alone. And H plus together with nitrate is an oxidizing agent, which is a lot better. Water is both a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent. <clears throat> so the strongest uh, reducing agent is probably gold here. And the strongest uh, oxidizing agent will be uh, H plus and nitrate, let's say. Here. We ha we'll have to use Appendix D for this in particular um, one. But anyway, uh, when we look at gold, um, gold is going to go to gold 3 plus aqueous. This is solid. And this is going to be, let's see. on page 827, I think. Try it.
Here's gold. Right there. It looks. Let's see, this is gold going to gold three plus. Here we have gold going gold plus going to gold three plus. Where's water? Here we have water going to oxygen. And so the situation here is, is, is this. I talked about the kinetics of oxidizing water as being more difficult than oxidizing um, atoms. And nitric acid, this is, <coughs> this is aqueous nitric acid. So if we said the strongest oxidizer is nitrate and H+, plus, and the strongest reducer is water, then we should have a reaction between nitric acid and water. But that's not the case, because we can make 16 molar nitric acid in water. And nitric acid is not attacking water. And so we're going to look at how favorable is it to oxidize gold. Well, gold is actually harder to oxidize than water. And so I should put a little asterisk here. And so we're going to just say, you know, kinetically, uh, the only thing that has to happen with gold is uh, <clears throat> you have to strip an electron, or three electrons in this case, off an atom. Okay, then we have our nitric acid. And so this is going to be nitrate plus 4H plus, plus actually three electrons in this case. It's going to go to NO plus two waters. And then we'll add up these two equations. Well, it just so happens three electrons lost, three electrons consumed. So electrons balance. And so we end up with gold um, plus a nitrate, gold solid plus nitrate, plus 4H plus. Um, this is going to yield gold 3 plus, plus nitric oxide gas, plus two waters. And when we do this, we say um, this is our reducing agent, this is our oxidizing agent, the combination. This is our oxidizing agent going backwards, and NO and water, this will be our reducing agent going backwards. <clears throat> from the chart, we can see that we're going from weaker, weaker, to stronger, stronger. And so there's no driving force. The driving force is actually the reverse direction here. So no driving for it. So based on our Chem 1A style prediction, we, we predict delta G should be greater than zero. In other words, delta G is greater than zero. It's non-spontaneous. But what we're going to do is we're going to quantitate it now. How non-spontaneous is this? And there are different methods. We're going to learn even more methods later on. But uh, the method we have is um, probably the easiest. What is the easiest way to determine delta G? The easiest way to determine delta G is to do it under standard conditions at what temperature? At 298. So let's go ahead and do a delta G under standard conditions at 298. And um, <clears throat> that is if we can find the data in Appendix D. Now, if the data is not in Appendix D, we'd have to look at other uh, data tables for this. Um, particular G. H I. Um. We have a problem. Um, the problem is, is the gold data is not in Appendix D. But we know that this one is greater than zero here. We would have to look up the gold data. All the other data is in Appendix D. Uh, we just need the delta G's of formation of gold 3 ion. And so let me see if we could find that. Um, otherwise, we might be out of luck here. And so that's actually called the standard free energy of formation for AU3+. Plus. So 
standard free energy of formation for AU3+. Plus. Um, do I see it here? So <clears throat> I still have a bit of problem here don't see it but it turns out there are other ways of determining actually maybe this is it here was promising for a minute but unfortunately it's not here but it turns out there's something else that we could do but we're not there yet and that is um, do you see these numbers here these are also related to Delta G and these are the voltages that we generate in these redox reactions this, this is related to the battery voltages that you get. And so using this number here, I can actually calculate delta G as well, because these numbers are related. And it's a very simple equation. Delta G is equal to minus NFE naught of the cell. And so I have to get a, a cell, and then I have to do a few more calculations, and then I can get the delta G uh, formation for the gold 3 ion. Well, that's further into the future. So, you know, we start to look for other things that might tell us. But <clears throat> what we know for, for right now is that this is going to have a positive. What we, what we can do is that this is going to be non-spontaneous. But what we can do is we can couple this with a Lewis acid base reaction. And that is, if we can take the gold 3 and <clears throat> complex it with a Lewis base ligand, and so what would be a favorable, you know, is gold 3, is that going to be uh, octahedral, you know, coordination number 6? Is it going to be tetrahedral or square planar, coordination number 4? Or is it going to be linear, coordination number 2? So in cases like that, you know, you don't necessarily know. This is something we learn from... Um, we learn from observation and so if we can go to um, appendix D again we can see um, the complexes that are common here. And so this is just a bunch of observations and then we try to collect some observations. So when we look at silver, it looks like all silver complexes are what? At least all the silver complexes here are what? Well, yeah, all the silvers are plus one and um, are they, what are they? Coordination number.
coordination number is two. We all have two monodend eight ligands, except EDTA here, which would be six. But that EDTA will encapsulate everything, though. But they are all plus one. Aluminum, coordination number six. Here, coordination number six. Here, coordination <coughs> number four. The te texture hydroxide, so two different ones. Cadmium, etc. And so these are some common complexes here. And um, we don't see gold there, unfortunately. We don't see gold. But we can find um, gold complexes. And in fact, uh, here. So it turns out that gold can form uh, with a coordination number of let's see, four. Do you see this? This is would be tetrachloride orate three. And so that's one of the um, complexes that you can find for gold. And so what we can do is we can try to do this. Try to form the tetrachloride complex. This is minus four plus three is minus one. This gold, and this is highly favorable. So delta G for this under standard conditions is much less than zero. And what we do is we can couple these two reactions. When we add up these two reactions, we'll get this as the net reaction. We have gold solid plus nitrate plus 4H plus plus 4 chlorides is going to yield. OK, the gold 3 cancels. And so we end up with tetrachloride orate. three plus NO plus two H2O liquid. Now the delta G for the net or the coupled reaction is just going to be equal to the sum of the delta G's for the steps. And so here we're going to have this with the first delta G is going to be positive plus the second delta G is going to be more negative. And so overall it comes out negative. And um, we can put the numbers in here. We just need the data. We're lacking the data, but this is well known here. Um, we could also go non-standard conditions. I don't know. Uh, under standard conditions, this might not happen. Usually what we do is we do highly concentrated nitric. That is, we use concentrated nitric and concentrated hydrochloric. If we use concentrated nitric and concentrated hydrochloric, we can get this to go. It looks like we'll need it in a ratio of four to one. So four parts of hydrochloric to one part of nitric. That's what it looks like. And, um, and we call this aqua regia. And so going under non-standard conditions is going to help this it's called aqua regia. And aqua regia can dissolve gold. Spontaneously. And so there's lots of examples of coupled reactions to accomplish it. And so the goal was to accomplish the gold. I mean, um, dissolving the gold. That was the goal, and we used a coupled reaction to do that, accomplish that.
All right, any questions on Chapter 13 stuff? All right, the next, uh, we're going to go back to Chapter 15. And uh, we'll look at an example here of a Chapter 15 calculation. Um, let's look at the formation of NO. We can form NO by combusting nitrogen or oxidizing nitrogen. Is this reaction very favorable? No. And how do you know? Well, we know because if it were favorable, we'd all be breathing nitric oxide right now, right? Because air is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. So we know that. So we know that delta G for this reaction um, let's see, let's get this going here. We know that delta G for this reaction has got to be greater than zero. And hopefully it's much greater than zero. In fact, I don't want to be breathing any NO because NO <coughs> is considered a hazardous gas, toxic gas. So um, let's let's figure out what delta G is under standard conditions at 298 Kelvin. And so what is my delta G under standard conditions at 298 Kelvin? What's the easiest way to calculate this? The easiest way to calculate this is by using delta G's of um, formation. And just take the sum the delta G's of formation of the products minus the reactants. So when I look at the delta G's of formation, which we call the standard free energy of formation, we know for nitrogen, what is it? You should know the standard free energy of formation for nitrogen because you, you should know what a formation reaction is defined as. A formation reaction is defined as the formation of one mole of substance from the elements in their most stable state under the conditions. So the formation of nitrogen, we form that from nitrogen. So we form one mole of nitrogen from nitrogen. What's delta G, the energy change? Zero. For oxygen? Zero. zero. But for NO, it's not zero. And so let's see, is NO more stable than the elements or less stable? We're pretty getting less stable than the elements. So delta G of formation for this should be positive, not negative. And so let's take a look at uh, the delta G of formation of NO, which is going to be about probably 26. Let's try that. No. Off, quite a bit off. I have to go one more. So delta G of formation is the second one, 86.55. See, the first one's delta H of formation, second one's delta G of formation, third one's the absolute entropy, and the fourth one is the heat capacity. So 86.55. Which makes sense, this is less stable than the elements. Delta G of formation is per mole. So 86.55 kilojoules per mole, one mole. But our delta G is double that. And so we need two times the delta G of formation of NO gas. And that's going to be uh, double this, 172.1. 172 that means it's non-spontaneous. Well, that's a good thing. It's non-spontaneous, right? But how much NO are you breathing? Are you, does that mean you're breathing no NO? Or what does that mean? Well, this is highly non-spontaneous. 
So what would you, the, the uh, K for this should be extremely um, large or extremely small. What should the K be? So that's plus 173. It throws it up here, which means that it's extremely small, which means we have very little product. Right. In fact, let's figure out what K is for this particular reaction. So if we want K, then um, K is equal to E to the minus delta G naught at 298 over RT. And so we can just go ahead and plug that in here. Uh, except I have to convert this from kilojoules to joules, or I have to convert R. I'll just probably convert that to joules. So this is going to be E to the minus 173,100 joules divided by R, 8.3145 joules per Kelvin divided by T, 298 Kelvin. And let's see what that number comes out to. to negative 173,100 divided by 8.3145 divided by 298 e to that and I get a k that at uh, t this is a k at 298 because k varies significantly with temperature as well so this is K value is going to come out to 4.561 times 10 to the minus 31. This is very small um, K value. 10 to the minus 31. So it's like 170 plus 170, 10 to the minus 31 between 10 to the minus 18 and 10 to the minus 36 here. So this is the equation we just used here. Yeah, it's very small, but how much NO would I expect? Do you expect any NO in this room at all? A negligible amount. A negligible amount. Well, let's see how much NO we would expect to find in the room. So this is Chem 1B stoichiometry. With Chem 1B stoichiometry, we're going to use K to predict the um, outcome. So we're going to use K for our calculations. So there are many different ways of getting K. And so we know that this reaction N2 plus O2 gives us two NO. These are all gases. If these are all gases, then um, th is this a KP or a KC? <coughs> This will be a KP because it's all gases. If it were all solutions, it'd be KC. If it were mixed, then we call it KEQ, and it would be heterogeneous. It wouldn't be homogeneous like this. And so um, this is our KP. But in this case, is KP and KC the same thing? Well, this is equal to KC because delta N of gas is what? This. Take a look at the delta N of the gas. What is it? It's zero. And so the RT term cancels. And so K, KP, KC are the same thing. So I could do this either way. But what I'm going to do is we're going to do this under standard conditions. Now, this is the weird thing with standard conditions. If I do this under standard conditions, what is the pressure of N2? Standard conditions says this is going to be exactly one bar. What is the pressure of O2? one bar. What is the pressure of NO? Yeah, normally we want this to be zero, but here we're going to have to have one bar. And now we have um, our standard conditions. So um, which way is this going to go? Is this going to go to the left or go to the right? Yeah. And so we, we already know it's going to go left, but sometimes it's hard to tell. And so we get the direction 
of reaction or direction of um, change. Let's say direction of change for the reaction. Is it going to go right? Is it going to go left? Or is there going to be no change? That's our question here. It's going to go right if Q, which is our initial, is um, less than K. It's going to go left if Q, our initial, is greater than K. And there's going to be no change if Q is equal to K. So Q is just the initial pressures. So we have the partial pressure of NO initial squared divided by the partial pressure of N2 and the partial pressure of O2. Um, this is easy because everything's 1. So Q is equal to 1. Under standard conditions, it's easy, right? Q is equal to 1. Now we compare that to K. When we compare that to K, we see that Q is a lot bigger than K. Right? K is 4.56 times 10 to the minus 31. Q is 1. So Q is much, much bigger than K. And therefore, the change is going to shift to the left. Sometimes it's difficult because we're very close. And so it's hard to tell. Is it going to go left or is it going to go right? If we screw it up, then we get a, you know, a negative number for the change rather than a positive number for the change. But anyway, the change is going to go left, so we're going to get plus x bar, plus x bar, minus 2x bar because of the stoichiometry. For every two NOs, we get one each of these. And so we're going to get 1 plus x bar here at equilibrium, 1 plus x bar here, and 1 minus 2x bar here. Now what we want to do is we want to solve for um, x. So let's go ahead and solve for x. Uh, using the K equation. So K we got from our earlier calculation. K is just equal to 4.56 times 10 to the minus 31. I should try to be more consistent with six things. This is going to equal the pressure of NO at equilibrium squared divided by the pressure of N2 at equilibrium and the pressure of O2 at equilibrium. Well, the pressure of NO at equilibrium is going to be 1 minus 2x. You know, I don't know what x is yet, and then we'll just square it. And the pressure of N2 is 1 plus x. And the pressure of O2 is 1 plus x. And so we're going to get 1 plus x squared. Do you see that? Now this looks like a quadratic, but we're in luck. You know, we're in luck because um, we don't have to use a quadratic equation for this. What I'm going to just do is I'm going to take the square root of this whole thing and take the square root of k. And then it should make our life much easier math for the math. The math can get tough. So what is the square root of 4.56 times 10 to the minus 31? I still have it in my calculator, so I'll just take the square root of this. I get 6.753 times 10 to the minus 16. Is that what you get? Yeah. This is going to equal 1 minus 2x over 1 plus x. All right, then I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 plus x. So I'll get 6.753 times 10 to the minus 16 
plus 6.753 times 10 to the minus 16x is equal to 1 minus 2x. And then I'm going to subtract this from both sides and then add 1 to both sides. Or actually, not add, subtract. Actually, let's add an x to both sides. So I'm going to have 1 point zero 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 dot 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 6753 x. I need 15 zeros here. Oh, 2x. Oh, shoot. It's 2x, so this I need to change this to 2. And then, um, then I'm going to subtract this from both sides. So this is going to be 0 0.999 dot dot dot. And so let's go ahead and do that. So I'll just do plus 2 equals k. And then divided the, by, I'm going to put this in parentheses, 1 minus 6.753 times 10 to the minus 16. Oh, I, I, I screwed that up. I need to flip it. Flip this. I get x is equal to 0.4999. It just keeps repeating. Is that what you get? Yeah, mine just simplifies it. It says it's 0.5. Um, this is the problem with the calculator. The calculator carries a certain number of digits. right? And so if you did it 0.5, then what would the equilibrium concentration NO be? Zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I got mine at 0.499999, and then I'm going to do times two, then minus one, and I want to convert this to scientific notation. And so my NO concentration, oh, come on. I'm going to carry extra digits here, 1298. I'll tell you why I'm carrying extra digits. Bar. Okay, this is going to be 1 plus the um, x, which is the um, 0.499. So this is going to be 1.499999. I don't know how many nines. I had a lot of nines. 1.499. I think I had at least 10 nines. Should be like 15. Yeah, 15 nines. Maybe. Actually, something like that. Anyway, um, the reason I'm going to do this is I need to double check the calculation. And so this is what we predict for the stoichiometry. And so what we do next is we uh, double check the calculation by plugging plugging these concentrations into the K equation.
And so what I'm going to do is I know what the K equation is. K is equal to um, the partial pressure of NO squared at equilibrium divided by the partial pressure of N2 and the partial pressure of O2. And these are both at equilibrium. And so I'm going to plug in this number here, 101298 times 10 to the minus 15. And then these two numbers here, this is going to be 1.499. This is going to be um, how many decimal? 15 decimal places. So that means I'll have 14 nines, actually. And so I'm going to take this uh, number I just calculated here and square it. So, so square this. And then divide it by um, this number down here. I need to square this also. 1.4999. That's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm going to put in 14 nines. I'm going to square that and then set that equal. And so I calculate a K value of 4.5605 times 10 to the minus 31. What was our K value supposed to equal? Our K value here is supposed to equal 4.561 times 10 to the minus 31. And so do you see it's a match? 4.561 times 10 to the minus 31. And so it checks out. Now, if you got 0 here, let's say your calculator rounded this to 0.5 would your calculation check out? No, because your K value you'd calculate would be zero. And zero does not match 4.561. And so this is a problem uh, with calculators. Calculators only carry like 10 digits. So you have to be careful with the calculator. And so we, we need to avoid round off error from the calculator. And so there are certain tricks we do to make sure um, we don't get round off error in the calculator. Now, the certain trick is this. So let me show you the first trick we do to avoid round off error. We know the change is going to be huge. How do I know the change is going to be huge? I know the change is going to be huge because my Q is 1, you know, but my K is 10 to the minus 31. And so I'm way off. Do you see that? And so one of the tricks is to make sure that x is small. Because if, if x is quite large, and x is going to be quite large, you know, because we expect a big change. And so I'm going to show you some mathematical tricks to, so that, such that we can calculate this using a normal calculator. So in other words, what happens is sometimes the some people will say, well, you don't need these tricks. Um, I just buy a more expensive calculator, right? And so I should never have to be able to do this. Or I'll just use Excel. Excel can carry 100 digits calculation, I think. But it's always possible to make it fail because there's going to be a limit to how many digits. So if you're using your TI, programmable calculator, there's a limit to how many digits that carries. 
And so what I can do is I can easily figure out what that limit is. I think it's 16 digits. And then just make sure your calculator gives you a round off error. And then you don't get the correct answer. You know? And so you might think, well, you know, don't need to learn this. But, but it's helpful because there's always going to be those scenarios where, um, where this happens. And so um, when we have large changes, Let's say we have a 99.9999999% change. What's your calculator going to do? It's just going to round that. It's just going to say, oh, let's call it 100%. This is a round off error. And it depends on how many digits your calculator carries. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, let's go 10, 11. I'll do 11 digits because it used to be the calculators only carried 8 digits. But now with the, the Casio, I think, carries 10 digits, so it's better than before. But this is round off error. When the change is large, the, the, uh, we're going to have a round off error. To avoid round off error, make the change small. Am I out of time? I'm out of time, sorry. How do you make the change small? We know the change is going to be large. Um, the way we make the change small is by doing a trick called reset the initial conditions. In resetting the initial conditions, we're not losing any atoms. All the atoms are there. We can approach equilibrium from any direction. It's reversible. And so if we push all the atoms to one side, it will eventually go to the other. This is Le Chatelier's principle. It's like a balance. So I'm going to stop here because I'm out of time. Sorry. I'll continue next time. So, um, so we're going to redo this. And you can try it on your calculator again, and you'll see you'll get the correct answer. We do this again.